Hi, my name is Udni Narayanan. I'm with the Google Assistant team. Today, I'd like to welcome Jay Kumar Menon for a fascinating Google Talk session on open source pharma. Jay Kumar is chair and co-founder of the Open Source Pharma Foundation, a global nonprofit. He's a human rights litigator by background, a senior fellow at the Harvard Global Health Institute, and a visiting scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health. He was given the William Rogers Award, which honors Brown's Alumnus of the Year. Jay Kumar is a social activist who is engaged in a wide variety of efforts, ranging from securing the freedom of wrongly convicted individuals in both life sentence and death penalty cases, to finding ways to address the problems of iron deficiency in nations like India and Tanzania. Today, he's going to talk to us about how open source approaches, which include potential open source vaccines, might help us with the battle against COVID. Welcome, Jay Kumar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a, a disembodied sort of talk. I think normally I would have been in Mountain View. Uh, greetings from New York. Uh, we have, I think at this particular juncture, uh, a number of things on our mind as a society. And some of them uh, are, are, are particular to your circumstances, but some of them are not. Uh, most of the world is thinking about vaccines and medicines and this pandemic that we find ourselves amidst and what can we do about them and how can we get them and will they be safe and will they be here quickly and who will get them? These are top of mind questions and these are the types of questions that we address in the Open Source Pharma Foundation community and movement. Uh, so a bit, um, as Uni mentioned, this is, um, uh, I'm the chair and co-founder of Open Source Pharma Foundation and I have a couple of positions at Harvard. And before I go into the specifics of open source pharma, I thought I would talk a bit about uh, my path to arrive at this uh, somewhat interesting effort. Uh, so I'm a human rights litigator by background and uh, worked uh, for a nonprofit in New York called the Center for Constitutional Rights and two main types of cases, head of state and death row and murder. And I think what I learned from these cases, these were my very first uh, you know, jobs in a sense, was that it was possible to think very big and act very creatively and aggressively. Uh, in the head of state cases, we represented the student leaders of Tiananmen Square, victims of the Bosnian genocide. Our organization, Not Me, won a few cases in Guantanamo uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, I helped free a, a man named David Wong as the 15th lawyer to take up the case. And it was after a death row case that I started to think, maybe there's ways to have even more impact. Uh, litigation was wonderful. Uh, I wanted to do something a bit uh, more proactive. And I started to think about, uh, could it be possible for, in a sense, the world to be my client? Um, I did a short job at the X Prize Foundation, helping them figure out how uh, these innovation models could apply to social problems, these uh, techniques of open innovation. And I started to think and plan my next steps. And it was really to look at gigascale social innovation, innovation that affect, could affect problems that afflict more than a billion people. Um, and uh, for, for which transformative change was possible uh, and um, uh, through a, a series of open innovation techniques. And the first project was in world hunger. Uh, and you may or may not know, two billion people in the world don't have enough micronutrients, uh, particularly iron. Uh, and five billion people every day in the world eat iodized salt, consume iodized salt. Uh, Google reaches about a billion people. Five billion people is up there uh, in the pantheon of fruits of human creation. Very few uh, things that we have created reach five billion people every day. And so, uh, you know, I think you're all clever folks. Two billion people don't have enough iron. Five billion people have iodized salt. What do we do? We added iron to iodized salt. And the project has gone to scale. Uh, it's been included in over a billion meals so far. Uh, we. Uh, uh, took advantage of radical cost efficiencies. This thing cost 25 cents a person per year. Uh, and now we're expanding to more nutrients and, uh, um, and to more, more geographies. Tanzania is the next one. Uh, so that's the SALT project. And that brings us to another global health project, Open Source Pharma. And so here I'd like to uh, ask my colleagues at Google to queue up a video of the Village Lab. As you can imagine from the title, you know, uh, using open source being in the title, we're a community-based approach and we use computation to try to, try to discover cures uh, for uh, public health problems and, 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 and diseases that affect many people, such as tuberculosis. So we'll cue the Village Lab video now. So can you believe that? This is my school, where I studied. 
and still it is like that when I was in 1973 to 7080 I studied here. I may be the first and last PhD from this school. Why I said to you that my, my case is different, my, my story is different because I never got a privilege to study in the big organizations. But I am very happy that at the time of after my PG, internet exploded. I used it. Now I can compete with any, any of my fellow scientists who got a good training from different universities of the world. Internet is an accidental outcome happened in the world education and civil societies. It is an accidental. Uh, there is a story in Kerala, in India, that is, it is known as ghost. It is just like we opened that port, ghost came out. The knowledge managers, the knowledge owners never expected such an explosion. If they are not closing that ghost and put, allow that ghost to come, go back to the port, then this village and all the universities will be almost similar in knowledge making and knowledge sharing. See, okay. I'll introduce all, all my students, my colleagues here. But before that, let me let me justify why I am calling this as a lab. Because generally when you are going to an institute, first they will show you the library and a lab. Right. And f now, after my experience four years in Indian Institute of Science, I understood that you can replicate the Indian Institute of Science chemoinformatics center anywhere in this country because everything is connected through internet. Even the Oxford University Library, Indian Institute of Science Library, uh, you can open up to anyone. So, they can work from anywhere, right? So, that the people will go back to their houses and will develop the cultural, spiritual, moral and ethical values. Why can't we do uh, everything like this? It's a, a, a not concentrated to one place, but it is shifted to many, many villages. See, I can tell you that, uh, see, my students could publish international papers from this shed. Means, this model is correct, no? Am I right? I will introduce Aisha. She is from a very conservative family of Calicut. Basically, they used to stop their education after graduation. But now she developed her own lab in her house. That means, I could develop people at different houses. So that university should focus to this. The antenna should move in a different direction. I would never dream that I will do research. I, I think that I will marry some guy, I will be in home, I will be looking after some kids. But but that time also passion was there. I want to do something, I want to do research, I want to do research in science, I want to do PhD. It's possible only because of internet. I'm learning, I'm doing myself. I can do my passion. It's a big thing. As per me, it's a big, big, big thing. We live in a world where only 5% of human diseases have an FDA approved cure. The current system is oriented towards the most uh, lucrative types of human diseases. That leaves the rest of humanity w without too much to rely on. So this is the core issue. Uh, we're also seeing in the pharma sector exponentially declining productivity, in fact, and extremely unaffordable drugs. So there needs to be a new method. 
and our intuition and insight is that what happened in the software industry could perhaps happen in the pharma industry and that open source principles could be enormously valuable in, in creating a new world. The Open Source Pharma Foundation is dedicated to discovering new drugs and discovering a new way to discover drugs. So we work at both an ideas level to show that it's possible to have an international effort that is, uh, creates a new way of doing pharma R&D, or, or more colloquially, to revolutionize pharma R&D. And then we're also trying to practice what we treat, preach and actually create affordable new cures. Good afternoon, I'm Jilly. <clears throat> I'm from South India, basically so the southern part of India, known as Kerala. I was working with students. I started one open lab at Malabar Christian College in 2006. Uh, what is an open lab? Open lab is a place where anyone can contribute and with a focus that can we work for neglected diseases. I call our first lab the open source hut and it was really um, an outgrowth of Jaleel's house. And they managed to tap into this national supercomputer system with the government of India on their laptops and look at a model of the tuberculosis bacteria online and engage in the most sophisticated types of research. I, I, I'm sure that I cannot discover a molecule. Can I discover a person who can discover a molecule? That's my question. That is my question. That is, I was always pushing the students, can you do that, can you do that? Can you sing a song so that someone will discover a molecule? You know, I'm from a village, very remote village in the Kerala district, see, where people are selling their household things to buy the medicine. That's all. They are selling their household things to buy the medicine. And we are discussing about credit and IP. Thank you very much. So thank you everybody and thank you Google team uh, <clears throat> for playing those videos for us. And I think that's given you a bit of an orientation about the people and what is open source pharma. But let me take a step back. <clears throat> Why do we even need open source pharma? What's the problem? And the problem is that there's a fundamental mismatch between the needs of human biology and the incentives that are offered by our, <clears throat> our current industry structure and market system. Uh, we have what are called low revenue diseases. And these are diseases where it's through nobody's fault. It's just simply an ineffective place to focus one's economic energies. These include tropical diseases. These include rare diseases. These include diseases for which like uh, the, the cure is very rapid, such as antibiotics. And what this means is that 95% of all human diseases have no FDA approved cure, 95%. So that means that we're not talking about an exception here. We're talking about the rule. Um, so I think the, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, diagnose and remedy some problems in, in the pharma industry. And one of them, you're in the IT industry, you're familiar with Moore's law, Moore's law, the exponential increase in productivity. In pharma, we have something that's called Erum's law, which is an exponential decline in productivity. And, uh, and this is just a, um, will not help us uh, produce the, the, the cures that we need for all of the diseases that we have to solve. So like I mentioned, only 5% uh, of availments have an, an approved cure or treatment. Uh, <clears throat> other huge barriers, it takes two and a half billion dollars or more to, de to develop a single new drug. And also the process is extremely long, 12 to 17 years. So when you're, when a situation like COVID, we don't have 12 to, seven years to 17 years to wait. <clears throat> so we looked to the power of open source and you know clearly you know it, you, you use it every day, uh, Android, uh, Chrome, uh, uh, Mozilla, Linux, revolutionary in the, in the software industry. Could we apply it to pharma? Now, the initial objection I know, um, and you might say, and, and the attraction, of course, is clear. At Google, you think about scale a lot, I'm sure. You have giant server farms, uh, giant <clears throat> data processing centers, offices all over the world. Uh, we look at the world and we see thousands, and we see billions of people without therapies, and we also see thousands of people who could be involved in drug discovery uh, who are not uh, engaged in the process. So what can we do about it? So you'll say, how does pharma work? 
uh, how does open source work in pharma r and d? It's very simple. Uh, there's a few steps you need to do to make a drug or a vaccine, very simply. The earliest stages you can do online over the computer. So quite easy to do in an open source way. Uh, the middle step is harder, it's wet labs. And here we, we can look at crowdsourcing and uh, <clears throat> sort of Airbnbs, networks of uh, fallow wet labs. We have a methodology for open source clinical trials involving open data, crowdsourced commentary. Um, and then the last step is the key one, we already have an infrastructure that gets things out on a market basis to millions and billions of people. It's called the generic drug industry. If we can just create a new instantly generic drug. We can really change the world and improve the lives of billions of people. So you'll ask, okay, this is all great, but uh, what's the basis for it? Is this just some slides? No, there are some significant papers in nature on the subject. Uh, there have been significant efforts uh, from the government of India was one. Um, and there was a, conference that we held in 2014, uh, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, where we assembled people from all relevant spectra, you know, big pharma, small pharma, academia, NGOs, computer theorists, uh, pharma innovation experts, and we all sort of vetted the concept of open source pharma and found that we, we, thought, that it, we thought that it had potential. And so the, the nonprofit started, it got its initial funding in 2018. And uh, we are a nonprofit with, uh, it's a Southern-based nonprofit, um, uh, the Global South, meaning so Bangalore is the main office and there's presence in Paris and in New York. And quite simply, we try to discover medicines and, and vaccines in a new way using open source principles. And we don't wanna just be a meme factory. We actually wanna discover these drugs, but at the same time, create an ecosystem by which the whole world can discover things in this way. And our goal is not just philosophical, it's practical. We want to cut costs by over 90% and time by over 50%. So it's sort of Linux for drugs and medicine for all is our, our mottos. And <clears throat> the idea has been spreading. Uh, we now have uh, nodes and communities that span the, glo the globe. Um, and people always say, well, okay, that's great. If you're in this world, co computers are fine. Uh, what about clinical trials? That's so expensive. And, th and the whole process is so expensive. And here I start to think about I'm not sure if you've seen this movie. It's one of my favorites. It's called El Mariachi. Uh, and uh, it was made for $7,000. And then it uh, you know, spawned all sorts of other things. The next, the sequel had Antonio Banderas. And now the filmmaker Richard Rodriguez works with Qu Quentin Tarantino. But he made a, a film for $7,000. Now, if you want to make a drug, it costs about two and a half billion. And that's a concern. Well, the, 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 the estimates vary, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot, uh, somewhere between hundreds of millions and several uh, you know, high uh, uh, nine figure billion billion dollars is, is the price tag. And again, 12 to 17 years. We took on the problem of tuberculosis. Uh, one quarter of humanity is infected with the tuberculosis bacteria. Um, there have been no, the most widely used TB drug is 50 years old. It's just a, it's just a tragedy. And uh, we use an open approach uh, and we repurposed an existing drug for tuberculosis. I mean, for, for diabetes. Uh, called metformin. And in our first year of funded existence, we reached phase two, two B trials and we spent less than $50,000 to do it. Now this, this is several orders of magnitude less than a standard uh, pharma model. And, um, and, and so it's a, a great concrete advance. We're in late stage clinical trials. Um, and this is along with the government of India. We've also been doing a lot of work in computational discovery, both creating IT tools, a sort of Google maps for TB drug discovery. Uh, as well as doing computational drug discovery and publishing more papers from that shed. And we really focus on the community and the movement. Uh, so we're trying to bring this community, well, it's already in, into being, we've been nurturing it, our, our team has been nurturing it for about 10 years so far, and it's expanding and growing and it's, 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 it's global and it's vibrant and we do what we can to support it and nourish it. Um, so it sounds like an audacious idea, open source and pharma, uh, there are some very credible parties that uh, the community and the, and the nonprofit are working with. Um, the N National Institutes of Health, Harvard, the Tata Trust, the TB Alliance, uh, the Mayo Clinic. Um, and the funders have been some of the establishment funders. So we've got you know, major philanthropies in Mumbai, in London, um, and uh, in uh, all over the world, in fact. And 
So far, it's been philanthropically funded because our cost structure is exponentially lower, but it's also when you're working on tropical diseases, uh, as we have been, the profit margin is, is, is quite a bit lower, uh, and fairly non-commercial, you might say. And there's been a fair amount of press, you know, Fast Company, uh, The Economist, Forbes, uh, it goes on. Uh, Bill Gates has actually tweeted favorably about open source uh, approaches to drug discovery, and we've pinned this on our site. Uh, and we got a little award from Fast Company magazine. Um, this brings us to the current pandemic, and there's actually at least two pandemics ongoing right now. Tuberculosis is one, and COVID is another. They are both respiratory pandemics, and in both of them, we are working on repurposing uh, to address these respiratory pandemics. So this is something that's engulfed the world. You know, we're all affected by it. Um, um, I'm in New York, a few degrees of separation from people who've passed away. Uh, my aunt in New Jersey does not want to leave the house until we have a vaccine. I'm sure all of your lives have been disrupted. Um, <clears throat> and it goes from the very bottom to the very top. Everybody can get this. Um, and so pandemic means it addresses it, something that introduce, uh, affects the whole world, pan. And uh, so if you were a Martian and you came down and you were observing our little planet Earth, you would have thought that if humanity was facing an existential threat, that the solution would have been open source you would have thought that the whole world would have worked together at once, and you would have thought that the fruits of that research would have been available to all human beings. Sad to say that's not where the, 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 the process has been going, although it has been more, as Fast Company noted, more open source than any other effort to date. Um, and let's say it wasn't a Martian, but let's say it was a, a robot, uh, also from outer space. This robot may some, might say something like this, I call on all countries, companies, and research institutions to support open data, open science, and open collaboration so all people can enjoy the benefits of science and research, again, in response to this pandemic. Well, what happened? There was a call to that effect, and that was made, that was a quote from the Director General of the WHO. And we take this as an endorsement, a ring endorsement of the open source idea. Our time is now. We need your help. We need everybody's help to propagate this idea and make it put it at the core of what we're doing. Why? Not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the practical thing to do as well to save humanity. Science is built on the shoulders of giants. If we all work in our separate narrow burrows, scientific progress is slower and the access to the research is slower. And you'll say, well, what about the private incentives, et cetera? This is publicly funded research. Public funds should go to public uh, knowledge. So we have several projects that we think could really make a dent uh, in COVID-19. Uh, what we have, our secret weapon is really our philosophy. That's something that we have that the private industry and the conventional model just does not have. And it's singularly suited to the challenges that we face today where all of humanity needs to pull together and row, uh, row oars in the same boat. So the first project is the antibody cocktail. So if you've been following the news with the US president, he took an antibody cocktail in the last couple of days uh, what it is, is if you, when you recover from COVID, you may have antibodies in your, coursing through your veins and arteries, and that can be transplanted to somebody else. And the DARPA technology, which uh, the president utilized, lets you mass clone and mass produce those antibodies. Now, it's very expensive, and these, are, uh, you know, these companies will charge a fair amount for it. Uh, our notion, we've been building this out, is to create a global network where you put the structure of the antibody online, then localized producers, small biotechs, in some cases, small hospitals uh, can produce the stuff on site with no royalties to, fit, to, to pay. And this, they, they, the early indications are that this gives you maybe three months of immunity. This is why DARPA in the US military took it up in the first place. So we could have a kind of global network of localized antibody cocktail production that could reach orders of magnitude more than the current model. And um, <clears throat> the second project that we've been working on is um, is repurposing. So every single, nearly every single drug that's in clinical trials right now for COVID is repurposed. Meaning, remember when I talked to you about the 12 to 17 years, we don't have the 12 to 17 years to make a new drug. So people are looking at old drugs and seeing if they apply to this pandemic. The problem is that there is very few, there's very little infrastructure for repurposing. People call their friends, try to remember what happened at Zika, with Zika, uh, <clears throat> there's no institutional knowledge, very little. And so open, OSPF, Open Source Pharma Foundation, in conjunction with the governments of the US and Brazil, NIH and uh, Fiocruz, uh, as well as a, an EU-backed group called the Atris, 
are creating a global hub uh, to, to pursue open source approaches and with a focus on repurposing. And so th the next project, we will call it sort of <clears throat> Red Hat for Medicines. Um, we are looking at uh, creating open source drug discovery software. And you saw the people in the village lab, um, <clears throat> they need software to work on drug discovery. And the current software is flawed in many ways. <clears throat> and so we have a deep knowledge of the community uh, <clears throat> and have nurtured this community for decades. And so we can see um, something happening si similar to what happened in, <clears throat> in software, where <clears throat> excuse me, wave upon wave of innovation is triggered by having the right software tools. So this is another project we're very keen on, and it may resonate with some of you at Google, and we're glad to talk about it. And now the big enchilada. OK, everybody is thinking about <clears throat> the COVID-19 vaccine. It's perhaps the most <clears throat> discussed pharma R&D project of the last several decades. The average person on the street is thinking about medicine discovery and vaccine discovery. And so what if we could create an open source vaccine? Now that sounds rather pie in the sky. Um, you know, is it just this little NGO that's thinking about it and some wild and willing community members? So who else is behind it? Um, and what does it mean? So an open source vaccine, what we've developed is the, is the idea of looking at open IP old vaccines from other diseases and repurposing them, just like we did for tuberculosis, against, uh, against COVID-19. And if we could in fact do this, it would be so much faster and have so many advantages. Now, uh, who's behind this? Well, an all-star cast of Harvard scientists and others. Um, I mean, these are sort of the, some of the legends of global health and of vaccine science and public health and infectious disease. Um, <clears throat> Paul Farmer, you may have, many of you have, have heard of, and I'll also draw your attention to the person on the lower right, Tachi Yamada, who led R&D for not only the Gates Foundation, but GSK, Big Pharma, and Takeda, another Big Pharma. So they are all endorse scientifically this concept. And you say, how does this work? You know, uh, how can you use a vaccine from one disease against another? And I won't go deeply into the science, but suffice it to say that if you have a live attenuated vaccine, which is a living organism in a weakened form that goes into you, your innate immunity uh, reacts and blooms and is tuned and trained in a certain way that gives you a broad umbrella, umbrella of protection. The, your baseline, your innate immunity protects you against many things, not just a specific uh, a pathogen. And this has been, uh, you know, sort of published in the Holy of Holies, the New England Journal of, Me Journal of Medicine, just this month. Um, and so then you'll ask, okay, there's a mechanism, but what about real world evidence, clinical evidence? And I'm not sure if you remember the story of the USS Roosevelt, this uh, aircraft carrier where uh, there was a COVID outbreak. Uh, a thousand sailors uh, were COVID positive and only one of them uh, was uh, needed to be hospitalized. So, and COVID and they, sailors get uh, the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine when they enlist. So an indication that there's protection. And if you'd like the documents, we have the 100 page scientific reference document prepared by the, the, you know, the medical school professors at Harvard talking about how we've known for 100 years that these vaccines have uh, a broad range of, can, can convey a broad range of immunity. Um, and there's a cross national studies looking at infection rates versus vaccine rates. Uh, and there's a variety of, uh, of um, uh, powerful clinical studies, including a recent one that showed that uh, when elderly people were given BCG, there was a 45% uh, reduction in all respiratory infections, all, not just tuberculosis, but a broad range of in in infection, uh, infectious disease protection that was conveyed. So it's long story short, the science is fairly impeccable. These, uh, these are at the very least, they're worth doing trials. And then you'll say this cost, it's gonna cost too much. Well, how are we gonna do it? And <clears throat> here's the answer to that. It's, you know, we're talking at least or, or roughly a hundred uh, times cheaper to, to repurpose an existing vaccine um, as opposed to making a new one from scratch. Now, the next question you might ask is who's gonna stick their neck out and uh, really do this sort of, uh, uh, you know, tr try and, uh, you know, back this sort of approach. And you saw the list before of all the Harvard professors. And then the next question that you may arise is, okay, this is all well and good, it's conceptual. How are you really going to do it? Who's on board? And so the parties are the Open Source Pharma Foundation, 
uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, they will be the uh, PIs and can help coordinate the trial on the ground. This is in the US uh, in nursing homes and the government of India. Uh, they're, uh, they're on board as well. And you've seen some of the advisory team and the PIs. And then you'll say, well, okay, it's too, but okay, we've heard about Oxford and, and uh, Moderna and they're already on the case. And what do you guys have to offer? They're far ahead of you. Uh, no, they are not. You heard it here first. This is arguably an effort and an approach that's arguably in first place in the COVID vaccine uh, grand race, first place. And I submit this to you for two reasons. One, the, 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 the groups that are, the ballyhooed groups that are sort of at the front of the race are in phase three. These trials are also phase three. And then approval is not when it, uh, the finish line is not approval. The finish line is broad use in the population. And because these vaccines have been used by hundreds of millions of people, cost as little as 11 cents a dose, um, have, have a safety track record of decades. People are comfortable with these. Uh, they, the manufacturing is in place. There are huge advantages at the stages yet to come. So this is where we stand. And um, there are a few trials that are ready to be launched. They're scientifically uh, prepared. The sites are arranged. Uh, if we find efficacy, I won't say you should, you should just take these vaccines. We should have a trial first, uh, even though they are licensed and on the market. Um, we really are talking about winning the global vaccine race with a, an open source and just approach. And usually in life, you have to choose between the best and the fanciest and what is fairest. And here, the two converge wonderfully. Uh, and all that's really left is, is a bit of funding. The weakness of this model is that nobody really makes money off of it. These are vaccines that are already on the market for as little as a few cents a dose. So it's a philanthropic effort. Uh, and uh, government and philanthropy, the industry structure doesn't really support this type of work. And so just a few, uh, you know, uh, $3 million for the US trial, uh, $400,000 to $700,000 for the India trial. These are again, are first in the world, arguably. Um, and I put the nail up there because for the want of a nail, the, the, uh, the kingdom is lost. If we thought, if you really thought about it and you had a potential cure uh, or, or a way to stop COVID-19, and the whole package here is $10 million for multiple candidates, multiple trials. Wouldn't that be the best uh, quantum of funds ever spent? So there's a poem by William Carlos Williams. He's a physician and a poet, and I love it. It says, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So I was a little bit um, uh, nervous today because I was going to be speaking to all of you. And we have a chance, if I can persuade you and your heart is moved and your brain is convinced, we can fund these trials today. Uh, it's not a lot of funds. Between you and your networks, uh, we could crowdfund it. We could even have one person who covers the whole thing. Um, uh, our site, just Google Open Source Pharma, you'll find us. We have a donate page on the site uh, and it's a, you know, a registered nonprofit uh, is our fiscal sponsor. Uh, we also are working with a wonderful group called Consano, which is sort of like a Kickstarter for medical research but with a couple of added benefits. One, they're deeply focused on medical research. And two, they, uh, they don't take any fees. They're a nonprofit themselves. So what I would say to you is, uh, if you'd like more information, you can call us, you can reach out to us at, at these, uh, uh, here's our coordinates. And the, what I would close with is, we have a vaccine in the palm of our hands potentially. And it would be a pity not to, to pursue it. Uh, the red wheelbarrow speaks to us all. Nothing is more important. And the whole world could pivot on what you and I do this afternoon. And uh, in the next coming days, we can launch these trials. We can save the world. And uh, the world beckons for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jay Kumar Menon, for a very inspiring talk and informative talk. Uh, it seems uh, I was personally fascinated by the journey that you've taken from sort of working and helping the individual to kind of looking at a horizontal view and like attacking society level problems. So first of all, I thought your journey was, uh, was very interesting. Uh, the second thing is uh, I thought the notion of scale 
uh, was quite fascinating as well, that you can have a vis village in Kerala a, a node, so to, so to speak, uh, in terms of like this big human computing infrastructure to actually address uh, these problems that affect humanity. So uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, to all the Googlers out there, uh, if uh, you're interested and you're moved by this talk, I urge you to look at uh, the ospfound.org website so you can learn more about uh, what Jay Kumar and his team does, uh, as well as how you might be able to help. Uh, with this. So uh, in a minute or so, we're going to return with some Q&A. Uh, and so we're just looking to see what questions might have. Hi. Um, All right. So well, welcome back, Jay Kumar. Thank you. Thank and, you. Th thanks for the excellent talk. Um, we thought we would just jump right into Q and A. So one of one of sort of my newbie questions for you uh, sure. is, uh, you gave the example of the Roosevelt, uh, and you talked about just one soldier uh, being hospitalized with COVID. My question is, aren't we all uh, vaccinated with MMR? Uh, like, uh, what's sort of the revaccination requirement here for these old vaccines to still be effective? Sure. Um, Many people in the world uh, have, have been given MMR and given also BCG, the tuberculosis vaccine. Uh, they do sort of wear off after some time. So the latest thinking is that you would have to either get it for the first time or be revaccinated uh, in order to have the protection. This is all, of course, still being studied. And that's some of the purpose of these trials. Got it. Uh, another question, uh, just generally, like uh, obviously fundraising is challenging, but uh, in terms of the methodology or the problem solving aspect of what you're doing, what's the toughest part uh, about uh, building out these vaccines or treatments? Yeah, I would say there's, uh, there's an, performing clinical trials is always difficult. It's a, it's a logistical bear. And so you need to kind of find parties that have done this many times over. And, you know, we're lucky en enough to be able to find such people. Uh, there's actually a shortage of supply. Uh, most uh, epidemiologists and clinical trial specialists are booked up uh, with some of the sort of um, more remunerative projects. Uh, and this is what I hear from even the U.S. government. They have a shortage of scientists. Uh, we fortunately have a, some, a group of very passionate and idealistic scientists that are willing to do the work. Um, I think there's an intellectual battle. There's a sort of um, view that repurposing is not high science and not uh, so, so interesting. And I would submit that that's actually the, the wrong view. Well, one, of course, our goal is to improve human health, right? And uh, the body doesn't know whether this is a new vaccine or an old vaccine. Uh, the second is it's sort of a primitive mechanistic view of the body. You think, okay, we have this one little part of your cell that needs to be attacked by this one little, you know, uh, segment of, a, of, of a genetic material in the, in, the, in the vaccine. The body is actually a very complex system. And, uh, and those of you who study AI understand, you know, there's, there's all sorts of complex relationships. And this is what we're trying to tap into, a more modern understanding of the, the complexity of human biology. And that's what actually this New England Journal of Medicine paper that just came out, it's beautiful. It talks about how the old vaccine tunes the system and all the, there's this cascade of effects that, that provides you with this umbrella of protection. Um, what are the legal structures that you have in place uh, to ensure that uh, these things are actually shared and uh, not uh, kind of assumed by private companies? Yeah, here's where we have an unassailable advantage. Um, when you fund, right now, most of the vaccine R&D is being done by private companies. Much of it is funded with, with taxpayer dollars. And there's sort of a uh, wing and a prayer. You hope that they will make it available at a, an affordable price. The stuff is not being built into the contracts. Uh, there should there should be, as a lawyer, I would recommend two clauses. One, that the science be open, and two, that the product be affordable and accessible. Um, with us, there's a phrase in uh, in um, international law. It's from the, 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 the law of the sea and also the moon treaty called the common heritage of all humankind. And we are using open intellectual property. Nobody owns this, but well, we can't monopolize it. Nobody can. And even from, uh, so there's no possible way that somebody could hoard this. And in fact, it's better even economically because we're not 
there's no monopoly here. There can be multiple producers. There can be competition. So at every level, it's it, it's it's better. Excellent. And I think my last question for you today uh, is: uh, How do you compare and contrast, from a personal point of view, working with the individual and working with scale? Uh, what do you miss about working with the individual, and what do you sort of uh, find challenging, especially challenging with working at scale? Yeah, I mean, when you're working one to one with a human being, you can really see that look in them in the eye. You can, you know, sense their emotions. You have a relationship with them. Uh, David Wong is somebody who will be a friend of mine for life. Uh, you know, I worked for what twelve years on uh, with him uh, on his uh, wrongful conviction matter, um, uh, and this work is much more abstract. Um, but I would say there's less difference than one might think. Uh, the litigation, at least that I was fortunate enough to be involved in, was all impact litigation. So it, it presumed you were trying to change precedent or affect a class or affect a policy. So it had the scale built in. And here, if, without working, if you're working a scale without being in touch with the community, I think that it's very dangerous in a way. So you need to kind of uh, really be in touch with the, the, the patient communities and the, and the justice and ethics angle of things, um, uh, lest you go, go astray. Excellent. Uh, we actually have a couple more questions from the audience here. So, OK, so Yogesh asks, how does the open source pharma protect and incentivize the work mission of key contributors and researchers? Yeah, so this is a key question. Um, and our short answer is it's a little bit similar to how it happened in software. We're not going to try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, so in software, and you all will know this better than I, uh, people contribute in order to learn, in order to be recognized uh, out of passion. Uh, here, what we do is uh, those same sorts of things apply. There's a, a community that you can become a part of. Uh, we have a, work with a lot with young people and they, who are trained in sort of basic science, but not in practical drug discovery. And this is often some of their first exposure. Uh, we have professors who um, wish to leverage armies of people. And so they benefit by having this. Uh, we do micro attributions. You know, we try to get people's names on the papers, uh, on the academic papers, or, or even uh, pieces of it. And we're exploring further models there. And then, you know, we're also looking at sort of, in some sense, uh, uh, we've been 100 percent, you know, philanthropic so far, uh, and we'll probably remain that way. But open source is not incompatible with revenue. You know, you you see that uh, in the software field uh, quite a bit, and so that may be a sort of longer term way to make this more economically sustainable. Excellent. Uh, we have another audience question. Eric asks, assume you had the full funding for the US and India trials of this vaccine approach tomorrow. What would keep the trials from starting the same day? How fast could you move? Yeah, so um, there, that's a great question. So one trial has already launched. So we have moved already. So the, the BCG trial uh, in India, which I didn't mention because it's already up and running uh, for elderly patients, this is the tuberculosis vac uh, vaccine uh, for elderly patients in India for COVID-19 is up and running. The first patient, the patient enrollment has started. The second trial in India is going through its next round of ethical approvals. Um, part of it is the whole process is a bit slower and more theoretical when you when you know you don't have the funding to do the trial but uh but we we are ready you know we have the the uh, the ethics approvals are you know it's a matter of uh a couple of weeks till they're done i believe and the sites have been identified and we're ready to go uh the u.s trial um the, the quantum of funding to be raised is larger the sites have been identified we just did a little twist today we may go in sort of to only nursing homes, we may, we may start to uh, uh, expand the population a bit to, to, to elderly people outside of nursing homes. So I would say, I mean, it's all fully in process. Uh, if you, the question is, when do we start? We've already started. If the question is, when is the first patient enrolled, uh, which means when the sites are identified and all the ethics approvals are in place, I think it's a matter of weeks. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I think we're at time right now. So uh, I want to just extend another really uh, 
heartfelt thanks to Jay Kumar for uh, today's presentation. It was really informative uh, and very inspiring that we can actually, uh, at the grassroots level, make progress, uh, not just on the battle against COVID, but actually progress towards better health for humanity uh, across the whole planet. So uh, it's great to see the work that you're doing. Uh, I just want to remind all our viewers to visit ospfound.org uh, to learn more, to contribute, to like offer your expertise and advice. Uh, thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank